Welcome to episode 55 of the Hoop Threads podcast here with the boss man, uh, Josh Pratt of Archbishop Spaulding Boys Basketball. How's it going, coach? I'm good, coach. How you doing, man? <laughs> it's been a whole day since I've seen you, so long. <laughs> Long time. Yeah, or talks or talk, talking or texting one of the other <laughs> yeah i've given you a break today it's only been like seven <laughs> all right uh so uh you know we're gonna get through a lot especially your coaching career um and i want to start with asking you as an assistant coach how did you let mike glick have that mustache man because i know he's gonna <laughs> this. And that was man i know it's the 90s but that's rough wow what, what explain that <laughs> uh i i really can't explain that that's kind of funny i mean that's the uh when when i played for him he had two shirts he had a pink shirt with a purple tie and a purple tie with a pink shirt so <laughs> i guess that was the uh that was the 80s look you know with the stash you know that type of thing it's kind of funny love it all right so you know, big theme, you know, for you as a coach and, and just as a as a competitor in general is there's a big uh, chip on your shoulder, which which I really appreciate myself because I definitely have that. So let's bring it back to your playing days, you know, at High Point, kind of talk about, you know, your your playing career or, or lag thereof there. And then, uh, <laughs> no. Well, yeah. Uh, well, obviously, I, you know, I went, I am a High Point grad. I graduated in 89. Um, and honestly, uh, just you know, never made the team. I was cut my, uh, never, I didn't try out my ninth grade year, uh, tried out my 10th, tried out my 11th and 12th grade year. And, uh, basically was cut all three years. Um, you know, I, I, you know, went back and played pickup and, and things and, uh, really tried to hone my skills. But, uh, honestly, I mean, high point back then was, a, a perennial power in, in PG County. Um, you know, they had a bunch of really good players. Uh, I guess my the most notably was uh, Christian Ast, my senior year, uh, who ended up going to Duke, and Wayne Bristol was a sophomore who was one of Gary Williams' first recruits. Um, you know, and they, they averaged, you know, Ernie Welsh did a great job, and, uh, you know, just didn't – just you know, just wasn't good enough, honestly. And uh, didn't mean I was a bad player, um, you know, and, and you know, I, I'll, I will say this. One of the things, I used to play pickup games at Beltsville Rec Center uh, off Selman Road. And, uh, you know, I loved to play and found anywhere I could play, I'd go play. And uh, there was a, a legendary football basketball player, a guy named Steve Brown that you know, I used to feed jump shots to a town square and got to know. And uh, I remember sitting with him um, at Bellsville Rec Center and really a 20 minute conversation kind of changed my life. I said, do you think I could play in college? And uh, he said, absolutely. He goes, you just haven't had a chance. And uh, he's the one who told me about Montgomery College and uh, the Germantown campus. And back then there was three teams. Now they only have one. And uh, so one of my best friends, I'm, I'm still good friends with, a guy named Tony Saunders, who I went to high school with, was an 88 grad. He drove me up to Montgomery College and uh, met Coach Hobson. Uh, and Hobson, you know, Steve Hobson, just he's changed, changed my life. I mean, uh, he's like a father to me. Uh, I lost about 35, 40 pounds. And, you know, the, the running joke is, is, I was the 15th man on a 13 man team. Right. I mean, you know, they recruited, you know, coach Glick recruited a ton of guys. Um, but you know, the one thing he said, and I'll never forget it. He goes, you know, you're on the team. And I said, well, I'm on the team. You've never seen me play. And he goes, uh, you'll cut yourself. You won't last a week. And, uh, when he said that to me, he goes, well, if I have to work my butt off and you're going to keep me on the team and I'm not going to be cut, um, I'm gonna work my I'm gonna work my ass off. And uh, guys failed off the team, and uh, they didn't do what they were supposed to do in the classroom. I did uh, barely, but I did it. Uh, you know, <laughs> I wasn't some road scholar, but uh, at the same time, that was my opportunity, and I took advantage of it. And uh, you know, when I'm coaching high school, I think the toughest thing, and you've been through it. We we all sat in a you know a couple weeks ago cutting kids and. That's the hardest thing. It will always be the hardest thing for me. I mean, uh, you know, I stress myself out about it. Where who, 
you're not only cutting kids, but where to put kids to be successful. So, uh, you know, I really try to evaluate that. I try to get as much input as I can. So, you know, I mean, you know, I found my niche at Montgomery College and uh, gained confidence. And uh, those two years were uh, outstanding for me. Um, and that's when I kind of blossomed, that, blossomed as a player. Yeah, you said you had some big. Uh, I think you said you had twenty four uh, in uh, in the regional championship game. I believe your junior, <clears throat> your first year, maybe it was your second year. Uh, talk about there, and then you know, ended up at your four year school, and then ended up kind of getting started in coaching after that. Working with Coach Glick. Well, um, I had tw- yeah, I scored I think twenty eight uh, in the region final. Um, it was my second year. Uh, we finished with uh, you know, I think thirty wins. We, we played really well um, and ended up winning the region to go to the national region 20, which is, I think it was at that time, Maryland, Ohio, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, that kind of that region 20, uh, you know, junior college, uh, whatever you call it. So um, we ended up going to Sunnydale High and playing uh, in the national tournament there. Uh, and yeah, I know Sunny Del High, right? Uh, <laughs> which is on the other side of the, it's on the other side of the moon, but, uh, yeah. but uh, no. So, uh, and then, uh, Newberry college was up there, uh, watching, uh, one of my good friends ended up being my college roommate, uh, uh, Rob Moxley, who was, uh, uh, in the ACC as a college, you know, as assistant, and, you know, he went on to bigger and better things, but he ended up, uh, they really liked him. So. He called me and he's like, hey, man, do you want to go down to Newberry College with me? And, um, you know, I'm going to go down there for my official visit. So I went down there and he actually had a bunch of guys that they were recruiting. And um, I went down there on a, you know, we went down Friday morning and uh, we went and it was obviously it was a it was a tryout. So played and tried out Friday and Saturday and and uh, played my butt off. And when I left. Sunday afternoon, um, Coach Quinn offered me, you know, like a grant and aid scholarship. And uh, so, I, you know, and, and I ended up taking it. And uh, so, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times, you know, Division Two, they don't have a lot of money. So they give partial basketball, partial financial aid. So it was kind of like a full scholarship. So I was able to do that and uh, played two years there. And uh, you know, and it was a great experience, really. I mean, you know, you had your ups and downs and things like that as a player because, you know, there was some talent. You know, Division Two, I think people don't realize how talented these guys are. You know, you get some Division One transfers or guys that are a little undersized, they can really hoop. And uh, it was a great experience for me, both, you know, I learned a lot, uh, positive and, you know, negative and things and what learned what not to do and what to do, you know. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. I heard you a uh, a pick and pop big. You you had a a J from what I hear. I don't know if I, could... I had a little J. Yeah, I mean I was a undersized post player. I had a little under, you know, Kevin McHale up and under move. Uh, for people that you know go back and Google Kevin McHale. I mean he was one of my guys that I love to watch. A little mini jump hook. Um, you know, but at that level, you know, I probably averaged five or six points a game, but people like playing with me because I was the guy, I was the ball reversal guy. I was the screen <laughs> setter. I was the guy that took charges. And, uh, but that's how I found my way again. And I learned that you, you got to find your niche, right? So, you know, at Montgomery college, I found my niche at Newberry. I found my niche and, uh, you know, I think, uh, just working hard. And again, like you said earlier, chip on your shoulder, you know, there was a lot of times I did, I played, I played and practiced angry, um, you know, cause I was out to prove myself because really a lot of people kind of growing up, never always told me I wasn't good enough or, you know, um, couldn't coach well enough or whatever, you know? So, yeah, I mean, it, you know, that, that's a motivation. Talk about, you know, getting into coaching, what went into that decision, you know, what made you really kind of want to pursue that? Um, I love basketball. Uh, you know, I didn't have many friends growing up. I had maybe two or three friends, um, you know, and, and so basketball for me was just a way to, not that I was a troublemaker or anything else, but just kept me out of trouble. Um, but 
you know, I always wanted to be a high school coach. Uh, you know, Glick and I, Coach Glick and I, uh, you know, is one of my mentors. He, we talked about it when, when I worked with him at Pilate. And, you know, 23 years old, I, you know, um, I was kind of still finding myself. But I, I always knew I wanted to coach. And so when, when Coach got the job at Pilate, you know, it was a great situation. Um, I almost took a job at Good Counsel. Mm -hmm. uh, a guy named Joe McCall was the head coach there. And uh, Mark Joseph was the JV coach, who's still a good friend of mine, who's a referee now. But um, I would have been a, just a JV assistant. I wouldn't have had anything to do, excuse me, with the varsity. And, uh, you know, when I heard Coach Blake got the job at Pilate, and he wanted to hire me, he just said, hey, man, we're, I'm going to – throw everything at you you're 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 my number one guy and mm -hmm. you know for the, for him to have confidence in me that that way uh was you know gave me like you're gonna hand me the keys kind of then it's on you know and we yeah. went out recruited and built a program and but the other thing i i didn't mention was there's a guy dick brown who was a freshman coach at dematha uh who coached at saint jerome's and uh when i was 18 years old I needed a job. Uh, there was a guy, Charlie Brown. Dick, Dick Brown passed away, and so did Charlie Brown. But they both worked at St. Jerome's, and uh, you know, they they were mentors for me as well. And and uh, Charlie knew me when I was like 11 or 12 years old, so he knew me, you know, growing up or whatever. And he goes, "Hey, man, I have a, you know, do you want to be a camp counselor?" And he kind of followed my career and everything. And uh, I said, "Absolutely." So. I started working St. Jerome's basketball camp when I was 18 or 19 years old and had that job and he had like six weeks of camp and it was great. And uh, so I was able to work out and play and coach and, and it actually helped me with connections in the CYO, um, you know, things like that. So when, so when I was hired at Pilates, you know, I told coach, Hey man, we got to go to Parkville high school and we got to sit there all day and watch COIO games. So that's kind of how it started. And then it went to AAU and boys club and those things. So um, I started coaching. I think I was 23 when I started coaching. So, um, you know, I was kind of doing a bunch of different things, substitute teaching, working at Pilates. I was bouncing. I was chopping wood. I was doing anything I could to, to make ends meet really, you know, Got you. So um, I think they were your first class, uh, Day Day and uh, and Rick, um, and then you know a year younger Nate Green, uh, yeah. Austin. Um, the latter two kind of ended up at Dayton. Uh, Rick playing for for I think four years at Marist. I don't know where Day Day ended up, but um, you know, talk about you know that class of kids and how important it was. You know, kind of getting things going. You know, at Pilate. You know building you know this is a trend that we'll we'll definitely talk about kind of building that program you know into you know a, a power that that the the big schools had to had to respect when they when they played you well you know again going back we were the little old Pilates division two I don't think anybody thought we would build it into a powerhouse and uh you know coach Glick you know, led the way, you know, he, he was the captain of the ships, so to speak. And, um, you know, again, we would go out to, you know, Park, 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 Parkdale High School and, and we would go to boys club games, AAU games. And, you know, I, you know, I had some connections with, you know, youth coaches, things like that. And uh, to, to, you know, uh, uh, Rob Jackson and Steve Turner, you know, guys, Steve Turner's head coach of Gonzaga, you know, me and Steve have been friends for years and, you know, uh, to recruit guys like Dave, David Morris, uh, who he, he, he was at Dayton with Nate Green, um, you know, that and Rick Smith, th that recruit, mm -hmm. those three really put Pilates on the map uh, when it came to, to basketball. Uh, I remember our first year at Pilates and we're playing at the Matha and, you know, we lose by, you know, 70, 80 points. And, um, you know, you're going through line and everybody's saying, hey, way to compete, way to compete. And we, we, you know, in the back of our minds, like, just give us a couple of years. We're, we're going to be here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Coach Glick and, you know, changed the, changed the, 
uh, I don't know, the landscape of, of the WCAC. And a lot, I don't think a lot of people give him credit for that. Um, you know, we, there was Division One and Division Two, And Division Two was O'Connell, who's really good now, PVI, who's nationally ranked, Pilati, Bishop Ireton, those were the four. And Mike went into the meeting and said, hey, man, we need to have everybody in one division. So we ended up playing, you know, everybody twice. And that really helped our recruiting. I mean, you know, that's why Nate and Day Day and, and these guys came, because they were able to play right away as young guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, that we kind of sold them on that fact. And, uh, you know, and then they were instrumental in the, in the uh, uh, community, too. I mean, they were really good kids. Um, you know, they didn't cause any trouble. Um, and I think the, the Pilates community really rallied behind that, that class. Uh, and we were very successful. Um, you know, the, the two teams that we struggled with, we basically beat everybody except for the Gonzagas and the DeMathis, the, you know, the Dick Myers and the Morgan Wootens. And, you know, I remember sitting on the sideline one time and I turned to coach and I said, you know, you got Dick Myers, Paul Evans and Bob Wagner, you know, and it's Pilate number two versus Gonzaga number one, you know, in the Washington Post and we're at Gonzaga and it's a sold out crowd and you're looking down the bench <laughs> on how much coaching experience. I mean, they had hundreds of years of coaching experience yeah. and here's, you know, coach Pratt and coach Glick. And, you know, we, we gave them a run for their money. You know, we had great seasons and that's kind of how it started. And, you know, we lose to the math, uh, what the first year by 80 by our third year, we beat them. We beat them and beat Gonzaga when they were both number one in the area back to back weeks. And I think that really set the tone uh, for building the program at Pilate. I was told that uh, you guys were so young that that before big games, you would actually suit up and practice against them. Kind of talk about, you oh. know, yeah, I'm sure that that sometimes didn't work out well for you, but I also taught, you know, Rick was saying it, it taught them a lot of the nuances of the game, like when to cut, like the timing, you know, screening well. You know, moving without the ball, you know, not letting the ball kind of sit, you know, kind of talk about the added value for that, um, you know, working. I mean, that's definitely a college move as far as, you know, having a scout team with some older guys to, to you know, swing their elbows around a little bit. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, you know, it, it's really like the old school, you know, playing pickup against men, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that, you know, the, the man strength, you know, to body up guys. And, uh, you know, I remember going against Nate Green and banging him and, and, and things. And, uh, you know, I was able to kind of score on him and things when he was a freshman, but by the time he was a junior, you know, he was, he was talking junk saying, coach, man, your playing days are over, you know, and, <laughs> which is, you know, honestly, if I was beating him in his junior year, then he wouldn't have been a, you know, a major division one player. Right. So, um, you know, and I remember, you know, you mentioned Rick, Rick was probably, Rick Smith, who went to Marist, uh, is probably the most, one of the most hardest working guys I've ever been around. Um, I remember working Maryland's camp. That was another camp I worked for years. And uh, I remember coming in at lunchtime when we finished our morning session and Rick's running the stairs at Coldfield House. You know, David Morris running the stairs at Coldfield House. And you know, that's old school workouts. You know, a lot of these guys have trainers now working on, you know, off the, off the dribble moves. And that's another story. I won't, I won't get into that because, you know, uh, I think you know how I feel about that sometimes. But, uh, you know, it's old school. And, and Rick really made himself into a player. You know, you had the Keith Bogans who went to, to Kentucky and the Joe Fortes that went to North Carolina and David Morris and Nate Greens and, you know, these guys that were ranked higher than Rick and Rick was the best defensive player in the WCAC hands down. Roger Mason Jr., who was with the Wizards and played professionally. Chris Monroe went to GW. I mean, that good counsel. I mean, the league was loaded and he just basically everybody literally the quote unquote ranks, you know, he he's the one that just kind of, you know, took it and ended up being a, you know, an all met player. And uh, that was through hard work. I mean, he, he was tip you know, he, he really uh, was a great example of what Pilates was all about, really. I mean, he, he just worked his butt off. 
talk about like what was the peak you know either for you you know or as a team you know while you were at Pilate uh the 98 team I think was probably the peak um you know uh and we've talked about this before just in coaches meetings but you know, we, we, we lost to DeMatha. I mean, I mean, and uh, there's no shame in it, uh, but uh, I can't remember. We won, I think, over 30 games, and um, our nemesis, you know, was DeMatha, but we got to the WCAC championship, and, um, you know, uh, Bogans hit a three to tie and sent it in overtime. Probably should have fouled, right? Uh, said things that just haunt you as a coach. Um, but, uh you know, we ended up losing by two in overtime, and then we went to Alhambra, same thing, you know, met them in the uh, Alhambra championship. But uh, I think, you know, if Morgan Wooden was still living, he would say, you know, those, those Pilates teams, anybody could have won those games. Um, it came down to one or two possessions. And to be part of that program and to be part of that, you know, just that atmosphere and learning, um, I mean, it was 5,000 people sold out at American University. I mean, as an assistant coach, you, 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 you can't learn. You learn, you know, the pressure, every situation, game situations and everything. I mean, relationships with players, all that stuff. I mean, um, it was a, just a fantastic um, experience. Uh, but that was probably the pinnacle of Pilate. Um, We did have a good group after that. Uh, Jerry Jack, who I've, I've known, who played in the NBA for 13 years, who I knew uh, from the Maryland Stallions and John Lewis, uh, I've known since he was nine or 10 years old. We had him come to Pilate. Um, uh, who else? Uh, Levi Watkins, who ended up at NC State, and Khalif Watson, who ended up at the University of Miami. So we had another group coming. We really did. And, you know, for whatever reason, it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Talk about, you know, <laughs> I was told a story that uh, you let uh, Rick uh, drive your white Chevy uh, after he got his learner's permit. Yeah, he, did you? Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, I guess part of being an assistant, sometimes I get, you know, my first six years coaching, you know, I didn't get paid, um, you know, and so a lot of, a lot of guys that are my age now, that are high school coaches that are very successful. You know, we talk about when we get together, we talk about how it was back when we were in the early 20s. We just love to be around, pro, you know, the program. We love, you know, we did it because we love basketball. We, we, you know, we were getting paid, you know, in, in experience and everything else, right? So, um, you know, what was kind of funny was, is the first six years I got paid in, you know, gear, and tennis shoes. So I would have to scramble for change to, to get these guys home and they needed rides home. So Rick comes up and says, Hey coach, you know, I got my driver's permit. I'm like, Oh, great. I don't have to drive home. I'm going <laughs> to let him drive home. So of course, you know, he got it from DC and in the state of Maryland, you actually got to drive a certain amount of hours in order to get your permit. Right. Yeah. So I didn't know that. I just assumed he drove out, you know, his hours. So he gets in the car and he puts his left foot on the brake and the right foot on the gas. I'm like, what are you doing, man? He goes, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. I'm like, you just use your right foot. That's, that's your <laughs> you don't use your left and your right. So we're driving on the, the highway. We, we go down Kenilworth Avenue and uh, we're making a left into his house and you know, there's traffic coming. I said, well, take your time, take your time, put your blinker on and everything else. But you could kind of see he was a little tense. So he goes and there's a car coming and I'm like, oh, you know, wait. And he was kind of indecisive and he hits the gas and runs up on the, on his fence, his, his parents front, like his chain link fence. And we're up on the fence and he, and he's got both hands, you know, pushing on the gas, you know, and, and you hear, all you hear the car is revving its engine. It's like, Ooh. <laughs> oh, calm down, put it in reverse. We back it off the fence. The car bounces, you know, and all those things. And uh, he's like, he just sat there for a minute and he finally turned to me. He's like, coach, I'm sorry. I said, Rick, it's okay, man. 
So <laughs> the biggest thing was was running into Rick's dad because if anybody knows Rick's dad, God rest his soul, he coached it for the Blue Devils, and he was a he was a short guy, but stocky and one of the most intimidating guys you've ever met in your life. And I'm thinking he's going to kick my ass. Like I'm like he's probably going to say, "Why the hell did you let my son drive?" You know. And I'm like, we're, we're going to be fighting in the front yard or something. Or I, he's going to be chasing me down Kenilworth Avenue. But uh, he was cool, man. He was. And uh, it didn't cause too much damage to my car. And, uh, you know, things like that. But it was pretty funny, man. Yeah, it was definitely funny. Talk um, about, you know, early on, especially being a player's coach and finding that balance between, you know, building the relationship, but also, like, making sure that they respect you. I'm sure that that's something, as a young coach, might have been difficult early on. Yeah, it was. It was definitely it was, it was tougher. It got better as I uh, got older because obviously the kids' ages and as I got older were much different. Um, my relationship with Rick and, and David, you know, Day Day and Nate are totally different than the relationships I have now with the players. Um, and a lot of that is just the years. Excuse me. Um, you know, it was hard. It, it wasn't easy because I think people, you know, players at that time, and you can even ask Rick, like, we were more friends than we were. It was more coach player. So, you know, the, it, it was hard to find that balance, um, you know, uh, and that's something that I learned through the years, uh, you know, being able to talk to kids, being able to put things in perspective. You know, not, you know, you can't just go into practice at a, as, as a 23 year old yelling and screaming at a kid that's, you know, 17 years old. I mean, there's a four or five year difference. You know, they're looking at you as like an older brother. They're not really looking at you as, um, you know, a, as a coach. And I think, again, it goes back to you asked me that question about playing. I think, you know, playing against the kids. I kind of earn earn their respect, you know. At 50 years old, I can't play against the kids anymore. You know, too old. So um, it's more of a it's more of a balance. It's more of teaching. Um, and again, it goes back to Steve Hobson too, who's who I learned a lot from at Montgomery College. You know, I knew he cared about me. I, I didn't always like what he had to say to me, <laughs> but I knew he cared about me, and I knew he he loved me. Um, and that's why I still have a relationship with him. That's why I take my family down to Curie Beach. He's retired in North Carolina now. And I, I'm able to take my kids down there with, with Janie and my wife. And, you know, it, it just, uh, and we talk basketball. And, um, you know, we tell stories. And, of course, some of the stories are a little more exaggerated or whatever. But <laughs> when it comes to, you know, uh, if you're a young coach, you really got to, sometimes you got to, keep your mouth closed. You got to understand what your role is. And uh, that's what I was at Pilates, you know, um, from what, 93 to 98, I was a JV coach. I learned how to make the calls and varsity assistant. And those guys look at me different. Um, but I think they respect me now more. You know, a lot of times those guys, you know, again, the Nate Greens, Rick Smith, they respect me a lot more now than they did back when I, in the twenties, you know, yeah. um, they understand because now they, you know, cause now they're older, um, you know, yeah, that's they're coaching and going through the same stuff too. Absolutely. Yeah. Talk yeah. about, you know, making the move to uh, Archbishop Spalding, uh, where, where we're both coaching at now. Uh, you went there initially with uh, coach Glick in 99, I believe. Uh, talk about yeah. building that program you know, kind of what you walked into, kind of some of the first steps of, of building up that program into a BCL kind of powerhouse? Um, oh, man, it was it was great. Uh, you know, you know, obviously leaving Pilates was tough. And, uh, you know, I'm a loyal guy. That, you know, I have a good group of friends. And Mike and I, I mean, I've known Mike since, you know, I was 17, 18 years old. So, you know, when Mike got the job at Spalding and asked me to come over, I, I didn't even hesitate. I took the job as a JV coach and varsity assistant. And we inherited a really good team. I mean, Derek Snowden, who's part of our alumni association, 
Um, you know, he was a senior. Tremaine Robinson was ridiculous athlete. I mean, he was at a 42 inch vertical. Um, Isaac Brooks was another kid that was phenomenal. And then I had a group of kids on the JV, Will Bowers, who ended up going to Maryland, Timmy Brackney, who went to Rochester <laughs> and a couple other guys. And so we, we developed a bond with those guys. Um, we had some very successful years. I think we won like three MIAA titles and two Baltimore Catholic League titles, uh, in, in that run from 99 to 05. Uh, and you know, we had the program going. We were nationally ranked uh, a couple of years there. Obviously, we had Rudy Gay, who played for the Spurs. He uh, was probably our most notable guy. Um, Landy Thompson, um, who went to Mount St. Mary's. I think he's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, so we had some talent, man. I mean, a lot of talent. Lawrence Dixon went to Holy Cross. Um, Marquise Sullivan went to Loyola. Uh, Justin Castleberry went to Bucknell. Um, uh, we had a seven foot of Jason Lockery that went to Mount St. Mary's Gus Sturr went to Mount St. Mary's. So we had, we had a lot of talent, uh, and it was great coaching those kids. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, uh, these guys have gotten older and they were looking for a coach and, uh, yeah, you know, and this, the alumni there basically is the biggest reason why I'm back at Spalding and, uh, you know, if I didn't have those relationships and they didn't think I was a good coach, I wouldn't be back there, right? So, you know, when you coach, it's not just about the X's and O's. It's about your relationships with the kids. It's about them helping them develop as men and, uh, you know, being successful outside of basketball. And basketball is a microcosm of, of life, right? So, you know, I'm very fortunate. And going back you know, full circle. It really is full circle. Uh, Timmy Brackney is the guy that really pushed me for the job. And, um, you know, I'm very fortunate. Uh, you know, you know, coach, we were, we had a scrimmage this past Saturday and we had four or five alumni in the gym and, uh, you know, it was great. Uh, you know, they're very supportive. We're, we're doing fundraising. Um, I'm just happy to be back. It's, it's a job I've always wanted. Uh, you know, I, I wanted it for a long time. I've coveted the job for a long time. And it's great to have, you know, what motivates me is having these alumni guys back, really. Uh, guys that we coached back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And they got a lot of pride in spalling. I mean, they they want us to win, and but they also want to develop good young men, you know, and, and that's kind of what it's about. And in between those, you took on a lot of jobs. You know, first head job was at uh, St. Mary's Annapolis after, you know, Towson Catholic. We'll get to Towson Catholic in a second. But, um, you know, building programs, you know, working with the, the girls team at Pilate, you know, Chesapeake, Science Point, Chesapeake High, Huntingtown, you know, Indian Creek, and then back to Spalding. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, I have a little circle, coach. It's all good. It's, it's a lot. But, you know, talk about, you know, what, what kind of your first couple priorities were when you were, you know, just taking the job and, um, you know, what helps you kind of turn those around, you know, rather quickly? Well, I love the coach. Um, and I think, you know, especially like when I left, when I left Spalding, you know, Dave Lanham, who at, you know, again, when you talk about relationships, he was an assistant AD at, at at Spalding, watched me coach from 99 to 05. You know, he watched me coach at the JV, you know, for six years. Uh, and then he became the athletic director at St. Mary's in Annapolis. And, um, you know, we had a good relationship. And, you know, he's, you know, he, he wanted me to lead his program. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget that because I was a JV coach for like 11 or 12 years, you know, think, you know, from 93 to, you know, 2005, you know, I mean, I, you know, it, it took me a while. It's not like I didn't, again, it goes back to, you know, the chip on your shoulder, you know, you go to interview for jobs and they tell you you're not good enough. And so I found a guy that really believed in what I was doing and that was Dave Lanham. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, it, I was there for a year, um, you know, and we really changed that program around. We brought in a lot of, uh, good young talent, uh, and, you know, Towson Catholic came calling. And again, one of the reasons why was 
Danny Palumbo, who I coached on the JV at Spalding. Again, connections, relationships. And uh, his, his dad was the AD at Towson Catholic. Um, and watched me coach. And, uh, you know, he, you know, the community at St. in St. Mary's in Annapolis really watched what I did over the year um, and watched how I recruited and watch how I developed kids and things like that. And um, I think that's, you know, it's, it's all based on reputation, how hard you work um, and treating the kids fairly and, and things like that. And, and what happened was, is my staff stayed a guy named Brian Koenig, um, who was a, a, a sports psychologist at Navy, I hired. He lived like two blocks from the school. He ended up taking the program over. All the kids that I recruited stayed, and I ended up taking the Towson Catholic job, which was a nationally ranked program. I mean, so I'm going from a B conference school to an A conference school, but a lot of people didn't understand. You know, I'm coming from Spalding you know, in Pilates, where we had nationally ranked programs. And, you know, I knew what it took to be successful at that level um, and was able to kind of, you know, it wasn't in, you know, I didn't know, which you end up jumping quickly. It kind of makes, I guess it kind of makes you look bad a little bit, but mm-hmm. at the same time, I had to take advantage of the opportunity, right? And I think parents understood that. Uh, and so, St. Mary's was very successful. They won B conference titles. Um, and then I was at Towson Catholic winning, you know, a conference titles, a BCL championship and things like that. And was able to, you know, keep the kids there. I mean, you know, uh, and again, it goes back to relationships. You know, I was very fortunate at TC because those kids could have left. They could have left and they stayed parents stayed. Um, and we, we're 90, I want to say we were 98 and 40 in the four years I was there. We won three titles uh, before the school closed. Uh, and St. Mary's is very good still. I mean, they, they, you know, they've had some transitioning coaches, but, you know, it's, um, you know, I left it in good standing, mm-hmm. um, but ended up having to take another opportunity, which I thought, you know, was a good one. Mm-hmm. Got you. What did you learn, you know, I'm sure being the head JV coach, you're kind of, it's a different seat, you know, you're making all the decisions, you know, there's a lot more, you know, you have to deal with parents a little bit more directly (laughs) than than as an assistant coach. Um, What did you learn with, with that, you know, working as a head, you know, JV coach and then a head varsity coach and then, you know, working with the, the Pilates girls team. I mean, that's a lot of, you know, experience kind of at the, at, you know, as the captain of your own ship, so to speak. Um, yeah. you know, how is that different? And, and you know, how did that help you moving forward? Um, being a JV coach uh, was a lot of fun because, you know, like the only ones that really cared were the players and the parents and the coaching staff, you know what I mean? Like, your name what I learned, paper. <laughs> well, I, I was very passionate about it. And, I, and what I learned, you know, I would take losses home, you know, like the varsity would win and the JV lost and, you know, I'm on the bus and everybody's all fired up and happy and I'm taking the JV loss personal. And what I learned was, is, you know, JV's for development, JV's for teaching you obviously want to win and, and kids want to win. Don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not downplaying that, but, um, you know, and then I was able to learn to make your own decisions, you know, time and score and what to do uh, in game time situations, you know, are we going to press here? What are we going to run with three seconds left baseline out of bounds? What are we running with 10 seconds left, five seconds left, up three, down one, sideline out of bounds place, you know, things like that. Are we going to press here? Are we going to foul here? Um, and so I was able to learn that over, you know, 11, 12 years, you know, and so that was kind of an apprenticeship, right? That's, you know, so, um, you know, it was longer than I wanted it to be, but I think it made me uh, not only a better coach, but a more mature coach. I mean, I remember losing, you know, we're up 25 at McNamara and I'm thinking, okay, we're, we're, you know, and ended up losing, you know, we're games one. And um, I remember, you know, we lose in the second half in overtime and uh, it devastated me, 
You know what I mean? But then I had parents come up to me and say, hey, man, it happens. You got to learn from it. And, uh, you know, and that's always nice to have parent support, you know, when they they go out of your way to talk to you because, you know, they they know you have their son's best interest in mind. Um, and so those are things that I learned as a JV coach that translated to varsity. What I learned coaching a nationally ranked program like Towson Catholic is, is the routine, what to do, um, you know, how to get kids ready, understanding the, the limelight, so to speak, um, and understanding the ramifications and uh, uh, things like that. And I wasn't always perfect. You know, I, I, I didn't always, you know, I made mistakes, but I learned from all those things. And, you know, and that's why, you know, to co coaching the spawning program and, and trying to bring it back uh, going into my third year here, we're really still trying to improve the program, right? Like we're really trying to improve the culture and trying to get better every day. And, and cause I know the end goal, cause I've been there as a coach um, uh, from being a head coach and varsity assistant. So, mm -hmm. you know, those things are important. I, I kind of know what it takes, so to speak. So, you know, hard work and, and dedication and, and things like that. Coming back to, to TC for a second, um, where Malcolm Delaney and uh, Dante Green were, were two of your more notable players. Were they kind of incumbent? They were already there. Or did you recruit them? And uh, uh, I did not. I did not recruit them. They were there. Um, and, uh, you know, again, but they could have left uh, and they stayed. Um, I think they love the school, obviously. Uh, but, you know, I developed relationships with those kids. Uh, I think, um, you know, when I say players coach, sometimes that's, that's misconceived, you know, as far as, you know, they could just do whatever they wanted to, you know what I mean? Things like that. But I think they, they respected me enough and we were able to sit down and talk and, but I also let them play because they were good players. And, uh, you know, I just think it's kind of funny. I, I didn't really have a reputation at the time, you know, of, being some great coach, I was a JV coach from Spalding. I came from St. Mary's Annapolis. So I think yeah. the perception was you're just letting the kids do whatever they want to do. And mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't the case. And I have great relationships with those kids now. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they're great family men. Um, you know, uh, uh, I talk to those guys, I wouldn't say regularly, but thank God through social media and stuff, I'm able to text guys too. And things like that. And, uh, I learned a lot in those four years, uh, when it, again, coming back to making decisions, uh, I developed some tough skin. I mean, we're playing in front of 2000 people at Mount St. Joe's and everybody's watching what you're doing. A lot mm -hmm. different, a lot different than coaching at St. Mary's and Apples, you know? Gotcha. Talk about, you know, coaching that level of athlete, you know, high level, high major division one athlete. Um, and, you know, dealing with, you know, as their high school coach, kind of dealing with their recruitment and dealing with a lot of, I'm sure you we're dealing with a lot more college coaches in the gym and, you know, the, the way that that relationship goes, you know, you have to be honest, but you also want to put your best foot forward for your player. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, kind of absolutely. Thing. Yeah. I think, um, absolutely. I think, uh, there's a lot of ways you can kind of attack that. Um, I think the one thing that I'm very proud of is, is over the years is that I've developed really good relationships with AAU coaches, uh, right? So some, the AAU coaches have a lot to deal with it too, you know? And, and so, you know, if I'm working guys out in the fall, then there's 50 college coaches in the gym, you know, I'm relaying that message to the AAU coaches, right? Because, we got to have a good working relationship. And so that's full circle during the summer. Um, you know, who's talking to the AAU coaches? I want to know too. So then that way I have an idea, you know, coming, coming into the fall, what, what's going to happen. Um, and it also goes with, you know, strengths and weaknesses of the player. Mm -hmm. You know, whoever's coaching Dante Green, Malcolm Delaney, you know, Coach Corbett, did a phenomenal job. He's a legendary AAU coach in Baltimore. Um, and so we had a working relationship and we would talk about 
strengths and weaknesses of the kid. And I think, you know, that's important because we all, you all want to, you, know, you want to say the same things across the board with these college coaches. I think that's important mm -hmm. when it comes to family, when it comes to strength and weaknesses of the player. Um, and obviously I'm going to be a proponent of the player. I think any coach knows that, but you know, you also have to be honest and, and what they need to work on. Um, you know, things like that. And then you're in the respect of the coaches, you know, the college coaches too. So I think that all that stuff, all those working parts are, are important. Um, mm -hmm. And you got to put your kind of personal feelings aside, you know, um, it's, it's not about coach Pratt, not about coach Corbett. It's about the player and them moving on and being successful. Uh, Malcolm Delaney. I mean, I can't speak highly for him now. Yeah, I'd like to think I made him better, uh, you know, in a lot of different ways uh, from maybe as a basketball player, but also pulling him aside during games and talking to him and his demeanor and all those things. But, I mean, he's very successful. He's playing overseas. He played for the Atlanta Hawks for two years, and he's giving back. You know, he gives turkeys back over Thanksgiving. He has a coat drive in Baltimore. Um, he bought a shopping center in Baltimore and has redone it. He's got a workout center and he's given back to Baltimore. That's more important to me than anything else that, you know, so, well, what was that about? That's about his parents. Uh, I remember Vince, you know, going into my, you know, going into, you know, Malcolm's senior year. Um, he called me on the phone and honestly, when he called me, I'm going, Oh my God, what's, what's going on? Uh, but he called me and he said, Hey man, you know, enjoy the ride whatever you need to do, you do, or you got my a hundred percent support. Mm. And for him to do that meant a lot to me as a young coach, as coaching a nationally ranked program, top 10 in the USA today. And I was like, it's on like that. Those are things that, that mean the world to me that I'll never forget. So, and I translate all that stuff now, you know, um, with Cam Whitmore's recruitment, you know, it's a lot different this year with zoom meets and things like that. Um, and one-on-one -on -one conversations with, with coaches. Um, and again, talking to AAU coaches, that's just my experience. And I think AAU coaches respect me for that, but, you know, to, you know, you gotta be honest with the, the college coaches and what they need to work. Mm, got you. Talk about some of the differences, uh, between, you know, working in public school, you know, the, the next, uh, four jobs after, after <laughs> we're we're all we're all publics you know talk about you know dealing with private schools coming in to, to try to swoop in and grab your players you know the differences and you know the restrictions they put on travel you know but also some of the nice things like you don't have to worry about tuition you don't have to worry about you know some of the other stuff that come with with coaching at a private school um man that that's a loaded question i i uh there's a lot of different ways um you know, when I was at Chesapeake Science Point, uh, you know, it was an up and coming school. They wanted to have sports programs, you know, things like that. Um, you know, and, and Tim Stedman, who now is the assistant AD at Crawford High School, you know, he asked me to take over the program. I wasn't going to do it. And, uh, you know, you know, what am I going to teach these kids? But, you know, you know, I had some personal things going on in my life at the time. Um, and it was probably a, it, it really was, you know, faith and God honestly put me in that position. And I'm very fortunate because I was able to get back to coaching and teaching, you know, basics to kids that just love to play. They weren't the best players in the world. You know what I mean? They weren't major division one players. They just wanted to play high school basketball. So, you know, those that, you know, from there to Chesapeake High School, you know, I took that job three days before the season started or a week before the season started, really. And, you know, I inherited that team, <laughs> inherited the coaches. So that was another challenge. And, you know, people, I mean, I had friends of mine call me on the phone in both of those positions that why the hell would you take any of those jobs? And it goes back to love the basketball. I love you know, hey, man, if, if guys want to be coached and guys uh, want to play, I mean, it goes back to when I played, you know, 
I didn't have the opportunity in high school. So in order to, you know, I want to, I want to coach kids that, that love to play. Um, I'm going to challenge them and try to get them better. And, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot in those situations. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, with Chesapeake Science Point, again, it was back to basics. Uh, but I was very appreciative to have the job because of some personal things I was going through mm-hmm. uh, health wise and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, Chesapeake High School, you know, those kids needed a coach, you know, I mean, that that's kind of what it was. And, uh, you know, I had high school come, coaches come up to me and say, that's coaching Siberia. Why would you take that job? And it's <laughs> like, you know, listen, you know, I mean, beggars can't be choosers. Right. So I was able to coach. Yeah. And it was tough. It was tough, but, you know what? Um, we went from getting blown out by 30, 38 points, 35 points to, you know, the second time through the season being very competitive and losing games by one or two points. And I'll take those victory. You know, I'll take those as victories and mm. you know, things like that. So, um, you know, and, and again, me coaching at that level and earning the respect of other high school coaches got me to Huntingtown. You know, I'm at the state finals. And that Huntingtown job was open. And if I wasn't doing the right things and people thought I was, you know, uh, an asshole, let's be real. Mm -hmm. um, Or I wasn't in it for the best, best interest of the kids or, you know, whatever. um, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to interview at Huntingtown either. Uh, You know, Sean Gross gave me that opportunity. He was the athletic director at Huntingtown at the time. Mike Rudd at Glen Burnie and Will Maynard at Southern. You know, I went against those guys. They respected me as, as a high school coach. They saw what I did at Chesapeake High School. They're the ones who talked to Rashawn. They're the ones who are saying, hey, you need to hire this guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't know anything about Huntington. Um, you know, and I was able to talk to Rashawn, and then things kind of started rolling, and that's how I ended up down there. I mean, so real, so, quick, real quick on that, on Huntington, I heard uh... – you know, the first week of tryouts, your your two best players, the twins came late and uh, <laughs> you, you, you turned into the track. I wonder who you heard that from. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So they came late and um, I had to set the tone and, uh, you know, we, we ran the kids. We did. We ran the kids. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I will say this, running them and setting the tone uh, really, um, you know, really changed their attitudes and under, you know, they, they understood that uh, I wasn't messing around and mm-hmm. uh, you know, we, you know, they went from, they were eight and 16 the year before and uh, we went 21 and six uh, with the same group of kids the following that, that year. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we did have one casualty in the, in the running. I don't know if, you know, coach Bias told you, I, I heard which about kind it. of scared me. He, <laughs> yeah, he passed out, but he was fine, healthy, and and everything else. But I think that had to do with the night before. And again, that was yeah. the reason why I ran kids too, was because, and that's why we had early practices, is to keep kids disciplined, mm-hmm. you know, so they wouldn't be out till, you know, eleven or twelve, one o'clock at night, doing things that they weren't supposed to be doing, right? So, yeah. But um, it, that did scare me, though. That did scare me. I yeah. honestly. Uh, that yeah, that kind of worried me. Thinking, damn, I haven't been on the job more than a week. I'm gonna get fired, you know, because the, the kid passed out. But uh, it all worked. That, it, exactly, it all worked out. That's exactly what Tobias said, actually. So you ended up winning the regional title, state final four, yeah. and then the next year an SMAC title. So you know, talk about the next job, Indian Creek, and then and then we'll get to Spalding. Well, yeah, I mean, again, but well, I, I'll, I'll go back to the other question too, like Huntingtown. Chesapeake High School, you know, when it comes to public schools, um, you know, there's, there's not, there's not quote unquote recruiting, you know, you can't go out of your district or whatever, but what you can do is, is reach out to the community. You can have a basketball camp, you can have clinics and, you know, if you're doing the right things and you're reaching out to the youth programs that are your feeder schools, and connecting with them, that's how you build your public school program. Now, the elite players still might go to a Washington Catholic League, a Baltimore Catholic League school. And the reason why is because they play more games and it's better exposure. And that's just kind of how it is, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's 
<laughs> has nothing to do with what you're doing as a public school coach. Um, you know, and you got, you got, you know, that it, it's kind of part of the deal, you know what I mean? So with Huntingtown, we did that. I mean, they, you know, uh, one of the fondest moments being in Huntingtown was going to the middle school championship game that they hosted at Huntingtown mm-hmm. and the place was sold out. It was crazy. <laughs> and we're running the concession stand and I mean, it's sold out standing room only with, you know, the, with the two middle school teams uh, in Calvert County. And, the, and the, you know, it was great. And it was great being there. And everybody goes, oh, you're the high school coach, you know. Mm-hmm. But well, my son's coming next year. And, hey, this is what we're doing during the summer. And that's how, you know, building those relationships and connections. It's great. But, uh, yeah, as far as Indian Creek, you know, little old Indian Creek, um, you know, I took over for a guy, Will Bartz, who did a great job there. Um, and in the MIAA, you have A conference, B conference, and C conference. So Indian Creek was a C conference school that moved up to the B. Mm-hmm. Uh, they stayed struggled, um, you know, the, the, the year before I got there. Uh, and quite honestly, like, my plan was to move uh, down to uh, Huntingtown you know, and stay down there, but the commute just got, became too much, and it's hard to get a teaching job down there. Nobody leaves because it's such a good school system, so uh, unfortunately, it didn't happen, and I just, I had to go. I mean, it just, it, it wore on my health, really, uh, mm-hmm. and so Indian Creek came open, uh, and Jamie Cook, who now is the AD at, at Mead High School, was the AD, and, uh, you know, he hired me, and um, my my first year, I remember Jamie coming to me and said, "You might not, you might, you might only win about five games." Because I said, "Well, how's the talent?" He goes, "You have one kid, Malik McKinney. We got two kids, Malik McKinney and Khalil Williams. Uh, Khalil's at Bowie State now playing. Malik's at um, West Liberty uh, up in West Virginia playing." But uh, but everybody else, I'm telling you, you might win five or six games. We ended up going 16 and 0. I think our claim to fame kind of was beating uh, St. Paul's, who was top 10 in the area at the time. And uh, we finished 19 and 3. And you would think people thought I was some, you know, I was Phil Jackson. You know what I mean? But uh, you know, in order, to, you know, to, to win 19 game was was you know, coming from a six and 24 team, we ended up winning 19 games was great. Um, you know, the kids, and again, it goes back to relationships and the kids, you know, believing in me and, and uh, liked what we were doing, you know, coaching wise and, and all those things. And uh, the following year, we did lose a lot. We lost a lot of seniors. I mean, my first year, we had eight guys. Okay. We won 19 games, 16 straight. I had to move four guys up from the JV in order to have a full practice. Wow. Okay, so that's basically what it was. So and I, pull, I pulled the eight guys in and said, hey, here, there's good and bad. The good, the good is, what, you know, I'll sub you out, you know, like, you know, I'll hold you accountable, but you know what? I'm probably going to have to get you back in because we only got eight guys, you know, and they started laughing Mm-hmm. But it's it was great. We ended up going. We won, ran ran off sixteen straight and uh, lost by two to Gerstel, who was really good at the time uh, in the semifinals to get to the final to you know get to the championship. But you know uh, Ben Thompson did a great job with his team, things like that. Uh, the following year, we went fifteen and thirteen. But I played. I started four freshmen. It's the kids I recruited. Uh, and the best thing about that season was we started out two and I think I want to say two and seven in the league and then ran off like eight straight at the end, uh, to, to get into the playoffs and, um, you know, and was able to build, I mean, we, you know, we had to regroup, you know, things like that, but overall very successful two years there. Well, so you were kind of talking earlier about, you know, coming back to Spalding, some of the alumni recommended you you know, for the position and, you know, you ended up applying and, and getting it, you know, talk about, you know, some of your first steps as far as assistant coaches, um, getting reconnected with the community there. And then, you know, your position at Spalding and, you know, you intel- you inherited some great talent, you know, that that class, you know, Cameron Whitmore, CJ Scott, you know, Ty Hill Peterson, 
um, still there as seniors, and, and that's been huge, obviously, to, to your uh, run here at Spalding. So kind of talk about, you know, the beginning. Yeah, I mean, uh, the first guy I hired was uh, Herman Brown, who I've known for a good five or six years now. Um, and again, he's connected to Coach Glick and Coach Corriero, who I haven't mentioned, who was my first assistant I hired at St. Mary's Annapolis and uh, kind of got him in the biz and uh, things like that. And was at Mead and won a state title there. Uh, but Herman was my first hire. And then Garrett Snoops, who uh, played at Spalding, uh, was a JV coach at St. Mary's Annapolis, actually. And so when I was at Indian Creek, I had a chance to watch him coach. I've known Garrett since he was eight or nine years old. He used to come to Spalding basketball camp back in the day when I was a JV coach and varsity assistant. So uh, I've known, uh, you know, they were my first two hires. Uh, and then, um, after that, I hired Kerwin Porter, uh, who is an AAU coach. At, well, he was at New World, now he's at Team Mello. Uh, obviously, Coach Aaron, uh, a great young guy that, uh, you know, has been a great hire. I can't hype you up too much yet, but <laughs> uh, but no. And then, obviously, we have uh, Chris Biederman now and Ray Bush. Um, Chris and Ray, and obviously, you are, are new to the program this year, but um, Herman, Garrett and Kerwin have been with me. They've, they've done an outstanding job. Uh, you know, they're still getting to know me. I'm still getting to know them, you know, that we're going into our third year. So, uh, you know, it, it's important to hire good people, um, whether they're good recruiters, whether they're good X and O guys, everybody kind of has their role. Um, and really what I try to do is, is, um, uh, everybody has value, right? So we, I want to try to find the value in our coaches, but I also want our coaches to coach. I don't want them sitting on the sideline, not saying anything to players. Uh, you know, I really believe that, you know, you're going to say the right things, you know, the rebound, hustle, work hard, hey, great job, you know, whatever, getting to build those relationships as well. Um, and a lot of that's because I was an assistant so long. Um, you know, I want I want that. I want my assistant coaches to be fully vested in the program because that's what makes them come back. Right. I mean, it's not fun sitting there, not saying anything. Um, you know, at the same time, obviously we will all want to say the same thing. We all want to have a unified front, but I think that's common sense. I think that that's, you know, that's something that I think everybody, if you're a good person, you know, that, you know, if you, you got hidden agendas, I'll find that out real quick, you know? So, uh, very fortunate. Uh, as far as the players, I don't know. I mean, I, I know people said that, uh, the, the that was the Tom class, too, by the way, we forgot about Tom. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Tom Schaefer. <laughs> so Tom, Tom I, I, let me, let, well, I'll save the best for last. There you go. So coach Schaefer, I've known for a, a really long time. He he's kind of the mayor of Crofton. So his kids, I, I met him through Crof Crofton youth sports, man. Yeah. Um, and when I was at Indian Creek, I did all these cold calls to, to, to build the summer camp. And one was to Tom and he brought a ton, he brought like 10 kids to camp. And so he said, Hey man, can I just hang out? And so we developed a relationship and, uh, he really helped me my first year because I, I was going to hire a freshman coach and two weeks before the season, uh, the, the guy couldn't do it. So I immediately called Tom and Tom said, absolutely, I'll do it. So Tom's been great. Um, you know, he's, he's, there's not one person that I've talked to that doesn't like Tom. He's the <laughs> most soft-spoken coach, but because you'll see during games, during like games he, he'll all different. of a sudden, yeah, he'll all of a sudden <laughs> erupt. He'll erupt and I'm like, who's this guy? You know what I mean? But uh, he's very competitive, and uh, he's been good to the program as well. So I didn't mean to leave him out. You know what I mean? But um, yeah. as far as the class, I mean, again, those guys could have left too. I mean, they're going into their sophomore year. Uh, Cam, you know, again, you know, what can I say? I mean, he, he uh, you know, when I got the job, I, I talked to him and his parents. Uh, we mapped out a plan. Uh, we kept him out of a lot of things over the summer. Um, 
lot of behind the scene things with me and him talking and things. And, uh, you know, again, if, if, you know, if he didn't like what we were doing, he could have easily transferred and he decided not to, um, you know, I think the, the class is obviously was, you know, I'm not saying they weren't hyped up coming in. Um, but I think they've gotten better since we've been, uh, I think the kids are, have grown up and matured. Um, and it's been a pleasure to coach them. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, it's been great to have them. I'm glad they stayed. I'm glad they believed in, in, in our program. So, you know, some of the, you know, former players and assistant coaches I talked to, you know, I, I asked them what are the characteristics of a, of a coach Pratt coach team. And the, the common thread was they're all, you know, they're going to be well coached. They're going to be tough. They're going to be competitive. They're going to run their stuff. We're, we're not doing that yet this year. We'll, we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, I don't know about running our stuff, Coach. I mean, we're trying. But, but the last part was that, you know, you allow your guys to pray, play freely, you know, kind of within the, the constructs of the offense and the defense. You know, you let them, you know, express themselves, you know, through their game and, and kind of let them rock. So, you know, talk about what you've learned as a coach and just not controlling everything, you know, just kind of letting them, you know, work their way through the game and, and develop. Yeah, I think um, any good coach, you know, you, you got to understand you can't, well, obviously you can't control everything, right? You can only control what you control. But uh, I think what I've learned is, is try to prepare the kids the best I can for that, for that next game. Mm -hmm. um, and then, it, you know, if they don't execute, we can go back and watch the film and say, hey, did I say this? Did I say that? This is the reason why we didn't, you know, we win or this is the reason why we did win. Um, and I think the hardest thing for me as a coach is um, letting the kids play, but understanding that in order to beat really good teams and have not only a successful season, but a championship season is getting them to understand what they need to do in order to win. It's the little things, it's execution. It's being able to run your sets and understanding this third and fourth option off of that set. Um, without them saying, without them thinking I'm trying to hold them back as a player. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes players um and we saw it saturday in our scrimmage right i mean and i don't mind saying this is sometimes you can shoot yourself out of games um because you're not you're missing shots that you maybe normally hit well then we got to change that up a little bit and then we are now you're playing defense 80 percent of the time and that wears on teams so mm -hmm. um i think there's a fine line there we, we try to do the best we can with that um I'd like to think I'm a player's coach, but I think at the same time, I got to hold kids accountable. I try to do the best job I can with that. Uh, but yeah, I want kids to play free, man. Absolutely. I want them to have fun. I think, you know, spirit and emotion is important. We just got to stay focused. And, you know, I try to tell the players, you know, you can only, you can control your efforts, you can control your attitude. Uh, and then it's your mindset, it's your preparation before practices before you get to a game, what are you doing before your game? Um, you know, you know, are you on your phone? Are you worried about your girlfriend? Are you worried like, what, what, like, you know, basketball should be your sanctuary, right? You should put all that stuff aside and really focus in. And, uh, you know, we have a chance this year to be very good and, and it could be a really special season, but at the same time, our schedule's tougher. Well, why is that? Because we had a really good successful summer and people want to come out and watch us play. Uh, we're an athletic team. We're going to get up and down the floor. But, you know, in order to win, we're going to have to do the little things to do it. Mm -hmm. Got you. Uh, two more questions, and then we got to get, get you out of here. I appreciate all the time you've given me today. So, yeah. um, you know, talk about what makes the DMV special. You know, when you go outside of the DMV and, and you play these national teams and go out of state for these tournaments, you know, what's, what kind of sets us apart from, from the rest of the country? I think it's over the years, man. I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot more 
you know, when it comes to the Washington Catholic League or the Baltimore Catholic League, you're representing your league. You're representing Baltimore, D the DMV. Uh, it's the Mecca of basketball, just like New Yorkers think New York is the Mecca of basketball or Philly guys. You know, there's an aura about you and you don't want to let your area down. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, um, you know, we're going to the John Wall Classic in Raleigh. You know, we want to represent the DMV. We want to represent the Baltimore area, our Baltimore Catholic League. To, to you know, we want to go down there and make a make a statement. We mm-hmm. you know where people naturally think we're you know we're one of the best leagues in the country, mm-hmm. and uh, I really believe that. I really do. I think our league this year is deep and very talented. And so yeah, man, you got you got a little you know you got a little swag to you. You know you want to represent and you want to put forth the effort. You know, and I think people are watching that. And there's an expectation there, right? So, um, you know, we want to, we want to, I want to come back from from a, the Christmas tournament playing well is the number one thing, obviously, yeah, because we want to, you know, that's to help us prepare for our league. But it's nice to represent this area and win, um, where you know they go, oh, you're Baltimore school, okay, they're you know they're going to have an expectation of us too, mm-hmm. so. I think all those things matter. Gotcha. A couple quick hitters, just this or that, and then we're going to get out of here. Uh, Invite three basketball minds to a dinner to chop it up with. They can be living or dead. Um, John Wooden. I use his quotes all the time. Uh, I got to say Coach K, man. You know, Coach K, John Wooden. Uh, and I'll, I'll say this, Brad Stevens. Mm. Uh, I love Brad Stevens and his quotes. Uh, but I, you know, I, shoot, man, I'd love to hang out with Popovich too. You know what I mean? Like he, he would be a guy that would be somebody pretty good to, to, to hang out with and talk hoops. Yeah. Uh, what coach have you stolen the most from? Uh, oh, man, I, I, Steve Hobson, uh, my, my junior college coach. I think. Um, I think he's 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 probably the most I've I've stolen from uh, X and O's. Um, uh, I'm gonna say Coach Glick, um, and then I would say guys like Coach K and Mark Few at Gonzaga. Like I, I like I I tell you what I do is uh, I really watch these all access programs and I watch. Um, how the coaches talk to their players. Mm. Um, I like to watch that. I like to watch the interactions on the bench. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think that's, that's really important. Um, So I think, you know, I really try to watch the mannerisms of of coaches and how they talk to their players. Gotcha. Uh, So you've had a, had a bunch of studs at, at, at your different stops. Uh, what's the one recruit that uh, that got away? <laughs> Recently, <laughs> it, there's got to be a couple. Oh, um, Bright, Bryson Tucker is the is the one recently at Spalding that has kind of bothered me a little bit. But uh, yeah, I mean that he's probably the most recent. Yeah, that's a good one. MJ or LeBron? Oh, MJ. Come on. Uh, you know what? I'm tired of that argument. And MJ is, but I, that's my error. You yeah. know, I'm not, I'm not, LeBron, LeBron's more like Magic Johnson to me. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you're going to say MJ, Kobe, I think they're more, they're more compatible than MJ and LeBron. LeBron's more of a distributor and makes yeah. players better around him, even though he's a little bit of a diva, but, uh, a little bit. What what uh what book is a must read for every basketball coach? Oh, Cal Parry's book, Players First. Yep. Yeah. Whoa. I mean that's good. Yeah. Whoa. I don't don't you gonna quote me on it? <laughs> no. Nah. Um, I got one. Uh, I got another one. that's John. It's from John Wooden. Uh, but I can't I can't remember the name of it. Oh, good. Uh, would you rather uh Would you rather take a charge from Shaq or try to guard KD with the game on the line? 
Oh, guard KD with the game on the line. I'm I'm not taking a charge from Shaq. No. <laughs> What's the best dynasty uh, in in basketball that you've seen? Boston Celtics. Which era? Larry Bird era. I think. Okay. Uh, the, like I grew up in that era, so it was the, it was the Lakers and the Celtics, and then the Pistons came, and then the Bulls came. Right. So I, I would think you know I mean you could probably put the Lakers in there too. You know what I mean? But I used I grew up in the '80s and watched watched those games. They were great. Um, you know, uh, Dick Stockton and and uh, Tommy Heinsohn on the call and stuff like that. Yeah. What's a great podcast or YouTube series that that you uh, watch or listen to frequently? Oh, for sports or just just in general? Just in general. Um, man, that's a good question too. Uh, I listen to, well, I'm a, I like Tony Kornheiser, um, old school Tony Kornheiser. Mm -hmm. Uh, I like Joe Rogan. Uh, I don't know if that's good. Should I say that or not? I'm just just proud of you for knowing Joe Rogan's name, honestly. (laughs) Really? (laughs) What what makes you, why would you say that? (laughs) Um, you're a you're a veteran coach. Uh, all right, let's let's move on to the next one. That, that's a good answer. What was the first time that you were in a room when you realized you don't know anything about basketball or you don't know as much as the uh, the people around you? Man, uh, uh, I was with a bunch of college uh, guy head coaches, like standing around Gary Williams during summer camp. You know, like Billy Hahn and. Those guys, like I, you know, the one thing I've learned in this whole thing is sometimes you sound more intelligent when you don't say anything. <laughs> and so when I'm around, when I'm around guys like that, I, I really don't say much. I just listen. This is um, yeah, I, you know, if I'm if I'm standing, you know, I've been to Final Fours and I'm standing with Bob Huggins and Bill Self, and you know, and I'm with other guys, you know, and they introduce me and I'm, hey, Coach, how you doing? You know, stuff like that. I mean, at the final four, you know, if you're if you're in the presence of head coaches like that, I just I don't say anything. I just I listen is what I do. Unless they ask me a question. If they ask me a question, then I try to answer it the best I can. Got you. Uh last one is what's the hardest shot in basketball to you? Like for to me, it's like on the break, you know, in the short corner when someone dumps it off to you last minute and you can't use the backboard. Is there any type um, of pass that you don't like? <laughs> I actually think nowadays the, the hardest shot is like in like a zone, a two, three zone or a one, two, two zone, or they're running the tandem stuff and a guy has to flash to the foul line mm-hmm. and catch and shoot. Uh, I, I think sometimes that mid range foul line shot could be really hard mm-hmm. uh, for kids to, to, to make, but I agree with you too. Short corner short corner but you said it already so i was trying to think of something different no that's good especially with the defenders behind you all right so that's that's all the questions i got for the uh for the end of every pod i kind of turn the tables and and see if you got a question for me so are there any uh burning questions you you got for me I got a, well first of all how do you like how, what do you think of coach pratt so far since you've been here before before the season starts put you on the spot <laughs> Yeah, you got to. Um, I really enjoyed working for you and, and, and with the program uh, as far as just kind of trusting me to to try a lot of new things. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I learned at the math that kind of, you know, just kind of waiting in the wings and, you know, in the stands I've been able to kind of put into practice. And that's been really cool. And like I said, just the the, the chip on your shoulder is definitely something that I've always had to. Um, and so, you know, I'm excited to kind of do what hasn't been done a little bit, you know, at Spalding and, and you know, capturing a, a BCL and a MI double A, um, you know, especially in the senior year, some of these kids, you know, it's a special group. It's a it's a really fun group of kids too. Like we don't we don't really have any, you know, jerks. You know, we 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 have good kids that they care about their academics, they care about the guys around them. And you know, now that we're finally getting into the flow of the season, you know, we have so many football guys coming in. You know, mess yep. with varsity tryouts and mess with JV tryouts. You know, we're in week week, week three, and we finally had you know our, our full team together for both of them. Yeah. So, you know, shout outs to, to Spalding football ten and zero, and you know a, a good finish in the playoffs. So, 
uh, excited about the the year and excited to to learn from you and the rest of the coaching staff. So I uh, appreciate you coming on. Uh, if you know your your Twitter and Instagram ads, it would be great if you can let, <laughs> let us know that so that we can uh, share. With oh, you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're killing me now. I got to do I got to think about it. I can tell you for sure you're at on Instagram is Coach Pratt, P-R-A-T-T Spaulding on yeah. uh, Instagram uh, and Twitter. Right now it is a S S coach. And we are yes. going to change that because we want it to be the same. We're going to change that. Yes. And, <laughs> you know, can I just say this? I, I've learned more from you technology wise than anybody else on my staff. So I really appreciate that. And I do laugh out loud when you send me text messages saying, Hey coach, this is the next step in the process. So <laughs> I appreciate that. So I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning. Definitely. There's plenty of room for improvement. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, I'm coachable too. I'm coachable too, man. Don't, don't forget it. I appreciate it coach. Thank you for your time. All right, brother. Later.